actually. There you go. Perfect. Okay, so this is the panel discussion on um, crossing the development chasm. I recently retweeted, it was an excellent hack that was done using blockchain for, uh, with VoIP for privacy, you know, calling and spam protection. And one of the comments from the developer was, boy, I learned a lot about VoIP. And that's an example of just how far we have to go as an industry when any developer that works on the APIs realizes, boy, VoIP is complex. Because it shouldn't be. I mean, back to what you were saying, Martin, in terms of uh, making it just uh, a very simple, easy to use API. So, what I'd like to do is open up to the audience. Any questions for, oh, actually, what I should do first, before I do the questions, it's apology. Uh, we have two new uh, panelists. So, Steve, Rob, if you could introduce yourselves. First, uh, you want me to go? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm Rob Pickering. I've been involved in the uh, the TAD organisation, I guess, since I uh, took a hack to uh, one of the first TAD hacks in uh, in Madrid in 2014. I will never let you leave. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I've done things like lead the London location, done multiple hacks over the years, um, built and sold a telecoms company, telecom software company around my RTC. <laughs> My name is Steve, and I'm alcoholic. Sorry, wrong meeting. Uh, I'm Steve, and I don't work in telecoms, but for many years I've used telecoms to build other things, which are very consumer, very high level. So I'm in that position of, really, I'm expected to know this just to send a text message, and I come from that. I mean, I'm, I'm a techie. I, I wrote C++ 20, 30 years ago. I started off by hooking a Nokia phone through a serial cable into a Linux box, to send text messages to my house to record video. You know, it would do an IR thing to my video. I don't mind the tech thing, but if someone's giving me an API or a webby thing, I expect it to behave like a webby thing, not like a telecoms thing. <laughs> Rant over. Excellent. So there's the panel. Uh, okay. So following up uh, Sebastian presentation, thank you. Um, one question that I have in mind is, uh, as a telecom, do you see that in the future uh, these CPaaS players can be peering between themselves and present, uh, you know, a new challenge because they're doing it over the top and you're not actually aware of it and just passing calls between them, like what's up with, it, with uh, actually using the phone number as your ID? What? I think yes. Well, in, in a way, they are already on the on the lowest common denominator, so you can send kind of calls in between. Uh, it sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't. So one of the challenges, for example, we had at Dimmer was when we um, wanted to verify a box phone number, uh, sending SMS through Nexmo, that SMS wouldn't arrive because I don't know they block probably their routes. They use uh, like like no direct connects. They use the I know gray routes or something, so it, it didn't arrive. So I, I think there is a peering. The question is whether. Uh, you're going to have that on the higher level. So let's let's say you have one WebRTC provider and another one, clearly you're providing one kind of WebRTC flavor next to another one, whether you will have a, a appearing there. Um, to me, I, I would say it's less likely. I, I, what, what I can imagine more is that, um, so appearing always, it's kind of the carrier world. You have two kind of guys implementing something and then you have an agreement of how to interconnect. But I think it's more likely that you will have a portability on top of that. So if, if there is kind of... A, um, a domination, um, let's say, of uh, of one standard. And on a, a previous conference, the, the guys from Web Innovations gave um, quite some some interesting interesting examples in the in the Netherlands where they uh, worked with a client. Um, they built an app on top of that, and that client wanted to uh, like deploy it in the Netherlands, but also in in Belgium because they're very similar markets and they couldn't. So they couldn't move the app from one from one platform to another because it was not, you know, the, the same interface. So I think what we'll see. It's more an, an agreement on, on common ways of doing this on this layer than, than an interconnect on, 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 the, on the non telco protocols, I would say, because this is simply not, not necessary, right? So if, if, you, if you consume it from, it's, it's not needed. If, you, if you're with Twilio and you build an app on top of Twilio, anyone using that app will also connect to Twilio. There is no need to kind of, yeah. there will not be a second app using Nexmo and you don't need to interconnect. The use case doesn't. Justify this, um, uh, in so my, my opinion. My point is uh, actually Twilio and other players trying to save money by not paying the telco fee. You know, so if they if they peer call yeah. between themselves, they are avoiding that. Cost. You could do that if you have classic. Yeah, okay. Or if you have classic call scenarios, you could do that. If you say, I don't know, you fall down to SIP, and instead of going by the carrier route, yeah. they have some kind of discoverability mechanism. That's an, actually an interesting thought. Yeah. Um, they could do that. I think much easier, and it's much more likely than doing it on the 
kind of um, <coughs> new kind of a policy stack. I don't know if that's going to happen. It's interesting. Thought you could essentially bypass um, okay. the carry ecosystem. Um, yeah, I guess. I guess why not? I mean, <laughs> it's a separate layer. I mean, the the, the I haven't uh, the picture we saw was kind of breaking it into layers. But even even if you don't take that they have that concept, I mean, if they would agree on it, they they could do that. The question is whether they're whether these are kind of still the first generation CPaaS carriers that are tied to the underlying carriers. And the question is, would, would they do this, right? I mean, OEMs could do that as well. Apple and, and, and Samsung could partner and simply bypass the whole carrier world, yet they're not doing it because it's an ecosystem. So that's what I meant with, with the ecosystem play earlier that I referred to. And I still think the big CPaaS providers at least are in a way depending on that because they make most of the traffic still with, with termination into the carrier world. So I think it's an interesting technical idea, but it's commercially, economically less likely that they will in the short term. Okay, thank you. Good remark. Uh, following on from that, uh, do you see a trend where the CPaaS guys are actually less cloud, more physical infrastructure, putting their own number ranges, building their own hubs coming out of the um, site? Yeah. Um, I think we've Again, coming back to the sample of Immer, we've worked with Voxbone, and Voxbone, I think, is doing that. So they, they, they resell carrier numbers, but in some markets, they act as independent carriers. I think uh, also with the focus on, uh, on, on on enterprises, they will have certainly regional offices or they will have contact points because that's what you need once you want to go into that market. Um, whether they will have uh, built up something like carriers too, like classic pops, or whether they will um, focus on any location that is enabled by the infrastructure they run on. So take AWS, you would be, of course, present in all the AWS locations because simply the way you build it makes it very easy. I do not necessarily think they will go beyond that from a strategic perspective, establishing pops like carriers would do. What I would think, though, is they, they do more and more integration projects. So the IMG sample that we've, that we've heard of earlier um, uh, was presented at another event. Um, there you see custom integration into uh, into their one of the one one of the big customers, and of course there you have kind of physical integration. So you would have a, a direct connect go into AWS and then being linked up to Twilio. I think this is going to happen, utilizing the infrastructure provider. But I do not think they will do this as as a, for, for differentiation to build up new or own pops in the way carriers would do. And just to contradict you, sorry, Sebastian. Yeah, okay. Uh, Telnix is an example where they built their own EPC. They have their own number ranges. They actually implement across the own global cloud infrastructure, a complete IoT network, so you never need to touch the public cloud, they've got their own numbers. So, but that's a vertical, they're very focused on particular verticals. In the more general case for voice, if there's already something there and the pricing is okay, you know, why reinvent the wheel? So it comes back to your argument around the interconnect is, you know, why break something, you know, why rebuild something that's yeah. broken? Okay, any other questions? Carol. Uh, I might have a good question about the, when you were talking about the uh, ultimate API to be a universal API. Yeah. So, do you really believe that's visible, or are you still just, just trying to figure out how to meet some of those, but we know that you will never match? Yeah, so, I will give you one example, which is you know, from my point. So, I used to call a different from my uh, so first, uh, there is no API for me. So I go through the user spread the user experience because uh, there is a puppet from the what we call that carrier, the guy who does a network signal. Ah, so they send a puppet with a message that makes no sense to me here. On top of that, I as an app don't get any feedback, so I don't have to go to And uh, it depends on the network provider. So some network provider will work with Suki and Suki. Uh, 14 and Suki. Somehow they decide they won't implement probably even with 14, so you have to dump it to 2G, so you can actually ask for it, which uh, was going to explain to the user, oh, you want to activate that functionality, please change your network permission from 3G or from LC or 4G, they don't even understand. So, uh, to me, the day where, as an app developer, I can have a simple API that would just do that simple functionality on any network or that. I just say it's never been done. That's my opinion. Well, from a technical perspective, I, I, I could, I'd be very fine with the idea. <laughs> so uh, we could spend like a couple of hours to talk about it. But uh, I don't think there's a, business, a simple business model. So I think from that perspective, I don't really see. You need a lot of money to establish such a, such a thing because 
enough people need to use that that make it attractive for the others to be part of that. So I don't know. Rather not, I would say. Um, the in, the idea of showing it was more like giving you the a different picture of from on the perspective. Um, and there are examples uh, in other domains. If you look into the, uh, I call it cloud, sorry. Okay. Um, the cloud hosting market uh, 10 years ago, right? There were like the AWS coming up, Google Cloud Platform, Azure and some others. Uh, it's the same situation. They do basically kind of the same thing, but on a technical level, very different. You sign into the one of, on one of them and you're locked, right? It's really hard to get out of it. Now today we have Docker and Docker container management solutions. And if you put whatever you have or you develop into a container, you give a shit, right? You can deploy to any of those providers and a lot of others that would provide, provide that level of abstraction. So if we would have had the same discussion 10 years ago about the hosting market, um, we would have said the same thing, right? But it said, ah, oh, come on, no, it's not, it's not working out, right? It's like those big guys, they, they're gonna, they, they're gonna do everything to keep you off the landscape. And today we have Docker. So I don't know. Um, I'm, I guess it's not going to ask to do it. <laughs> Maybe that's more like an answer to it. But it is a good question. I mean, something as simple as cold divert. And there isn't an API to do it. It's, I will pick on the telco here. By the way, yeah, one, it, it's an interesting use case because um, there is no API to do it yet. I've, I've seen APIs so actually in, in Slovak Telecom. In the early days of it, when I was still working there, when I tried to integrate it, there was indeed hidden somewhere in the IT stack an API internal without authentication or anything that you could use and you could set directly HLR settings. They did this as part of their provisioning chain, let's say, and it was, of course, protected by by uh, whatever. Yeah, so there, there was some kind of protection since we... So, so, um, but but, uh, but the interesting piece is that it was in, 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 in something IT built for themselves internally and... and Nobody would have thought that this IT application is something that you would expose externally. But exactly, that's exactly what I was kind of referring to. That if you would have this mindset of, well, we cannot easily connect to the HLR. Let's build a, a simple API and very easily integrate into that process. If this would be kind of uh, driven by, by by somebody being responsible for the, for the business as such and not just a small supporting unit, they would have very quickly come to the thought of, well, actually, that's working. Let's make money of it. We've seen this with, with TeleSign. You know, it, it, carriers have internal processes of, of preventing fraud. We have that. Others have this. Yet there are not many that expose this externally, right? I mean, your uh, TeleSign for me is an enabler doing that, and, and many other carriers could very simply expose what they have internally with, with an API gateway or with an IT thinking, but we are not there yet, right? And then the next level is, of course, do many carriers do this? Do you have a kind of standardization of these APIs? But the first step of making them available, I think, is a is a pure mindset question. It's very easy to do. It's it's all these HLRs are programmable, and if not, they are just databases where you can put a very thin programmable layer in between, um, and and you could have that. But but I'd say I mean, have to tens of billions of dollars invested in IMS. Yeah. We, we still don't that. have it, and now, of course, we're in 5G, yeah. and what will be tens of billions of dollars with the application gateway that's there? Is this... You don't have it, and, 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 and it, that's what I mean. So, I mean, IMS, IMS, the application server essentially should have been a component where you build applications on top. Yet it's not open, yet it's it's proprietary in so many ways, and you need to be a telco person to consume it. So. Um, I, I deliberately actually did not say, let's make the, the IMS programmable layer programmable northbound, but I said, if we introduce CPaaS, it doesn't need to be on top of the IMS. It can be somewhere uh, connecting to the resources that the telco system has, but it doesn't need to be in this complex um, IT-ified NT world. It can be an IT application on top of the assets directly, and, and that, that, would, that would be IT driven and not, not driven by the complexity of the telco people. It's the same thing with, with virtualization. You know, we, we try to do something IT did for many years and has a lot of experience now with the NT stack. And of course there are challenges, but it's still, it's not rocket science, yet we treat it like it. And, that, and that's, I think, the, the, the mindset of it being special and the mindset of, of over-engineering certain things and, and engineering by committee and so on. I think these are, there are many reasons for it and it needs a, it needs a drastic change in how we think we, we produce services and how we think we actually treat our assets. Do we expose them to, to enable uh, or do we close them and, and try to you know keep our complexity on top of it to differentiate by that or to, to, to live longer in a way, to extend our life, I don't know. Life I'm moving on, just, just yeah. for 10 seconds. 
So last year, about a year ago, Twilio was acquired Core Network Dynamics, which does EPC network calls. Any idea of what they're doing and whether that means that, that they're, they've got a defensible moat in some of their business areas? Uh, to essentially kind of, you know, either that's becoming a thick MVN no or something else. Or is it just about IoT? Uh, can I, can I yeah, go for it? Well, they look at the carriers and they see they don't move. So it's more likely that they become a carrier than the carrier becomes e yeah. <laughs> That's it. Okay. If they have a lot of money, right? And um, they they think about what how to spend the money. And then they, I'm sure they, don't like to have these complex contracts with 100 plus carriers to terminate. So if I be Twilio, I think about it at least. And then of course they, they don't have the, uh, let's say the expertise, so they buy these companies. That's, uh, that would be my actually, uh, if, if, if you are like an investment manager in Twilio, hmm. what what would you invest into? I mean, yeah, I was thinking specifically about having so you can see, is that about being you know, is it about doing private devices? <laughs> All of the above. Yes, yeah. the front ends of contact centers, you can do transients, we can mix the mobile. Yeah, so there's a lot of people doing it, probably there are only two seasons, but I don't hear it from any other CPAP players at the moment. But there's one specific technical reason they might want to do that as well, and it's around text fraud and authentication, um, that if you're just Text out to the network. There are a whole bunch of known hacks around, you know, the SS7 hacks, um, SIM swaps, and you know, the new fantastic Ofcom port numbers in 10 seconds uh, process. And if you've got visibility into the telco internet interconnect, you can start looking at some of that as part of your differentiation on fraud control. And I know Twilio are doing a lot of work on that, and that's how they justify the 13 cents for a, an SMS versus someone who's just, you know, doing A to Z routing of the SMSs, and you know, half of them are going to the bad guys and they're um, they're authenticating um, bank accounts based on all of that stuff. So, it, it, you know, even without the the, the 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 kind of the commercial stuff, there might be technical reasons they want to start looking like a telco or seeing inside the telco actually. Uh, exactly. Alex, raise his hand. Hi, um, if you don't know me, I'm Alex Pitch. I founded a company called Siron back in sort of nine years ago. We are sort of a wholesale version of Twilio with about quite a few pounds less funding. Um, we are on the edge of CPAP, so we are a wholesale traditional carrier, but we are completely API driven, we are completely self service. That was a necessity from day one because we had to make a small tip. Um, what's interesting is on the, the sort of API and the core control language extraction, is is it in Twilio's interest to make their APIs and their core control language under their audience? No. Is it in next mode or Telnix's interest to build a core control language that's like Twilio and an API that's like Twilio's API and then I use a plugin? Yes, of course it is. So for the challenger, I feel it's you know, it's in their interest to support keep it portal away, but it's not really, I don't really use the company here, but the other ones are almost there. It's not in their interest to say, let's have a stack that this would be great. Um, you know, I think Martin said that a Twilio, like the language that's kind of a veneer over other providers, that's great, you know, translation is what we fast. When you try and translate the Twilio API to look like the next one API, to look like Zara API, or the Delmix API, it doesn't quite work because Different people with different words, different objects, different ways of doing stuff. Different timings, there's a whole bunch of things. It starts getting messy. Now, the alternative is we spend the next 20 years from creating an XML based API that's going to be outdated because everything was written with XML and that's very much on the internet. Yeah, quite sexy, man. The GSMA API, great idea, terrible execution. So, you know, 20 years and everybody else is coming out of the just going to create an API and everybody else will follow it. So, you know, I guess my question is, should this sort of telco development of the future or anything else, should, should it be somewhere in like the open, open source community, you know, should it be like a project like Kubernetes where it's developed you know, by the web guys, the cool guys, the Googles as well, should we be taking this away from the GSMA to the developer as well? 
Mark, you're actually brave to say this in this room, right? I, I was not brave enough. <laughs> 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 no, but I, I don't have practice with, uh, with this. Um, it's an answer to the other question. Basically, I, I actually see that, um, like Google, for instance, might be the right uh, address to do so, because they did a lot of other things that became de facto standard and open source. So, and um, and I can only say yes to what you stated, uh, because we try to map at the moment um, different providers to Twimmel, and they do implement everything in a very different way. So different orders, like, I don't know what, uh, whether you know Twimmel, but it has verbs. Uh, so it has like a modular parts of it, and it's really kind of difficult, and I don't know whether it's the right way to match it, right? On the semantic level, or um, to go some totally different way, uh, I can only say yes. You're right. It's uh, trying to use a de facto existing standard like Twiml and match it to the other providers. It's a difficult job. It's not possible. Yes, I mean, my experience has been every vendor that claims they have their version of Twiml, they don't. Because response time for a particular sort of command is different. And this application, if you read, has a certain weight before it gives up. And as a result, you have to rewrite some of the code. You have to work out all these like internal parameters. And of course, it's journalists that are constantly evolving. So it's a game that you're constantly playing catch up. You need a standing team of at least, like, I don't know, 20 people to keep up with the changes on Twilio and the providers. I actually left the, there's an open Slack from the guys. I left the Slack because it was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the sign of what is this? Uh, so, just before you mark, so mark, do you want to add on? Oh, I was just going to comment. I thought that you know, from my perspective, the first interesting thing that's going to have is that you can see functions as a result. You know, in the telco world, uh, in which one I see, we see we can have a few ways of results. Uh, very much a problem for a lot of But from their perspective, I think. By the way, the, 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 the just also the thought on that the I think it's it's really if you don't look at it strategically with just the latency and the fact that they can deploy IoT gateways or, or packet gateways close to where their their IoT systems operate can be one of the trivial reasons to do that. We we are doing the same. We have in some countries legal issues, in some countries latency issues, and we actually deploy there as well regional packet gateways to break out the traffic. So that's that may be just a very simple explanation besides all the strategic ones mentioned. Well, perfect. Let's wrap I think it should be. So from, from my perspective, programmable telecoms or, or, or CPaaS, however you want to call it, is one part of the stack. But if uh, and I, I try to also depict that a bit. For me, the future carrier stack is overall and, and programmability over the assets you have. That may not be the next big thing, but it may be just more than using uh, communications or programmable communications or communications platforms as one narrow sample. But overall, if you make your the, the, the stack on top of your asset, if you make that programmable, and if you expose capabilities there, I think um, there's a much broader um, spectrum of, of value creation you enable than just focusing on homes. 
But um, yeah, I can yet for now not think beyond that, but I certainly think uh, if we as, as carriers would think of, uh, of programs of telecoms, we should think also programs of connectivity, of exposing our, I don't know, quality on, on our networks or, or whatever, multiple network augmentation, things like that. Um, yeah. So to your point, there are a number of people who are actively working on the next disruptive thing within the programmable telecom space. So absolutely, I think it's not necessarily a public discussion, but there is definitely quite a private conversation happening in this space. But actually, to both uh, Sebastian and Martin's point, are focused more on the experience than the end of the articles. I, I just have one little comment I'd like to make to that actually and um, you know part of it is that I think that perhaps the space to look at is natural language processing, natural language understanding um, and putting computers on the end of a lot of this communication rather than just mediating it. But I think the big question actually is can a company like Twilio pull a Google? In other words, break out of the space where they built, uh, you know, a really compelling early lead with a set of technology, and actually turn into a company that can innovate across a range of technologies. Or will they just be the, you know, the kind of the programmable telecoms guys? And I think that's the big question: Will Twilio manage to pull a Google or not? Mark, yeah, I think fine problems. Yeah, you go and see some So I think CPAS in a narrow sense that we talk only about communications. Um, of course, IoT devices may send SMS and use uh, use use the CPAP button. But I think, in terms of IoT, you can do IoT the, the legacy way uh, and provision using parts the legacy way, or you can do, can do it the IT way. As I, as I was showing, and I think we see some more conservative carriers, and I wouldn't exclude even ourselves, who are very um, conservative also in their business. So they have a classic process of um, provisioning SIMs, of developing them, of of, of making parameters available. Um, and of not making the parameters available, and we have some more um, modern companies that are a bit more progressive on that. And I think, of course, the, if you offer an, an, an IoT product, um, um, you need to make it programmable, and you need to offer parameters, and you may need also to interpret parameters for the customer to actually um, give them more than just the technology. And uh, and I have looked at so getting into wholesale just a year ago, I've looked at what we offer, I've looked at what some competitors offer, and I really see a difference there. In the way they make this, uh, they expose it in a way you can order things. Uh, I mean, there is an, it's an end-to-end -end process, and, and some make it very easy, some make it very hard. And um, I, I think what we as DT did in the end is as well to, to um, I've forgotten the name now, but, but there's a kind of spin-off that we have that focuses on IoT with our connectivity, but essentially um, did much better than, than ourselves directly on this on this programmable layer on, on making it part of a, of a business process when you order the IoT product and not just give you SIM cards, give you connectivity, but then leave the rest of the companies. I think that's what it's about. That's also what I meant earlier when I said the IoT paradigm needs to be part of the product. And that's essentially, I guess you could say it's an influence of CPAS, but I wouldn't say that CPAS as such is more this overall um, exposure that, that you need to add on an IoT product. Excellent. So we're coming up on lunchtime. So please, uh, for the panel, we'll give you a round of applause for excellent. Now, I want everybody disappears. I need to get lunch set up. So, Steve, Rob, I'm going to need you as my helpers to get all the sandwiches upstairs. Okay, so stay down here.